Hi there, I have now finished my playthrough of Detroit to Become Human uh, and I promised that I would make an additional extra video here at the end where I just look back at my uh, progress through the game, reflections on the game, thoughts about it and also uh, because it was pointed out to me in comments to have a look at the extras section in the game where there is some interesting information about Kara and also about Chloe and to collect some Chloeisms um, because those of you who may not realise uh, every time you turn the game on on, Chloe introduces herself and says something to you and I've tended to skip over all of those um, but they are an important and interesting feature of the game which is worth looking at so I collected a few of them and um, they're going to feature a bit later on in this. Um, so firstly my thoughts about the game well I found the branching uh, decision making mechanic absolutely fascinating and it was great it really made you feel as if the decisions that you took at each point could have a substantial effect upon the progress of your character the experiences they would have going forwards uh, and even their survival <laughs> Uh, it turned out in the case of one of my characters, my decisions must have been uh, of such a nature that one of my characters did not survive. That's an amazing thing to happen in a game. When you think about it, um, nearly all games that I've played in the past, the character has survived to the end. It may not have been the outcome that you know you would have wanted for the character but they did at least physically make it there and it's not guaranteed in Detroit Become Human I have discovered um, which is amazing because it really does give gravity to the decisions that you make the choices that you make um, it was interesting it was also stressful at times when you're presented with a menu of you know four options and you, you've got to read the words and the clock is ticking and you know you've got your finger on the button and you're thinking which one am i going to choose and you choose one and sometimes if you don't choose the game will choose for you of course you know that uh, sometimes when i made my choice perhaps 20 times when i made my choice the minute the moment i fraction of time i pressed the button i thought to myself no that was the wrong thing i shouldn't have done that and then subsequently events would unfold and they would confirm what i thought or events would unfold and i would sort of think well actually maybe that wasn't the wrong choice after all um it's that sort of unsettling uncertainty that they built into the game there, which was delicious. It was really clever uh, and enjoyable to experience. Stressful, but I suppose, you know, that was intentional, <laughs> but stressful in a nice way. I also really liked the flow charting. Um, I liked the idea that you could see the connections between earlier events. You could look at the different strands of progress through the storyline and it gave you teasers by showing you these grayed off branches going off left right and center from where you were some of them enormous and extremely complex with many facets to them all of them padlocked and hidden from view but an immense sort of um teaser as i say to make you think ah oh, you know i really want to replay this to find out what that is what is it i've missed what could it be um and you don't know you know it could be that you missed items it could be that you missed clues it could be that you had conversations with people where you took the wrong approach or said the wrong thing or didn't say the right thing or and the possibilities are endless um it certainly, I mean, it doesn't reveal anything about them. You know, it, it doesn't give you any clues. It's like you're staring at a locked chest, uh, which could contain something that's good, bad or neutral for your character in the story. And you don't know what until you open it. Um, you know, Chloe makes a joke about Schrodinger's cat as one of her introductions, which you'll see. And that's really clever because the whole game is a bit Schrodinger that you don't know until you find out. And you only find out by making this decision and, and, you know, then it becomes clear at that point, the consequences of what you've decided. Um, the other thing I liked about the, the gameplay, if we're talking about gameplay, is that uh, it didn't depend too heavily upon physical skill with the controller. Um, the reason I say that is because this, I, to me, this was a story and character based game. That's mostly what it was about. Um, yeah, there was some there was some physical dexterity required. There were um, incidents when you were in combat, for instance, with other 
humans, androids, whatever, where you needed to be able to react reasonably quickly to press the correct button as identified on screen. Um, you know, some people will say, well, that was easy. But uh, let me tell you, I mean, I've had a PlayStation 1, 2, 3, 4, and now 5. So I'm used to a, a PlayStation controller. But it isn't everyone, everyone's aim. It's not every game player's aim to become fantastically uh, dexterous with a controller. We don't all want to, you know, uh, set speed records. And some games that I've played, um, it's definitely detrimental if you can't react quickly enough. And reaction times do diminish as you get older. Um, I'd like to think mine aren't too bad, but, you know, it, it's a fact of life. So um, what I really loved about this game was that it did focus upon storyline and characterization. And yes, you were you you were controlling the character. You were physically moving them. There were things that had to be done, and and you know there were actions that had to be done. But at no point did I feel disadvantaged in any way, or did I feel that there was too much emphasis on the controller. Um, the the emphasis for me was entirely on being absorbed into the game and the characters and the storyline. And you know I never thought for a moment, oh oh I'm going to have to do this. Uh, you know I'm not going to be able to do this or whatever. And, you know, when you did have that tiny feeling and maybe you let it slip out, it was only a fleeting feeling. It wasn't all consuming. It wasn't present all the time and in any way hampering the enjoyment of the game. So that's my thoughts about gameplay. Um, going on to characters, I like to think when I finish a game, uh, who my favourite character was. I've always done this and I did it here. And the person I've picked is Kara. I could have picked Connor. Uh, but I think Connor was a fairly, um, although he went on a journey, I didn't see the end of his journey. Um, and I very much felt that he was sort of cut short before his time. Uh, entirely my fault, or my choice, I should say, because it's just how the game played out. Um, and similarly with Marcus, I, I, I felt with Marcus that I sort of knew he was going to go through a change because it was signalled very early on in the game. Um, in the conversation he had with Carl, where Carl said, I want you to find out what person you are, what your place is in the world. And that's sort of what happened. It happened in an interesting way. And I did not foresee the events that occurred in any way, shape or form. But for me, Kara was the exception. She was the unique one because she'd had a previous life. And, uh, you know, in the life that we met her, she is this blank page. She's been wiped clean, factory fresh, repaired. Um, you know, sh she's starting from zero. Whereas Connor wasn't. Connor was a formed person already. Uh, when we met him, we were very confident. It was like we're stepping into someone's shoes. You know, we were thinking, wow, this guy knows what's going on. And with Marcus too, he had a place and he was relatively content in that place up until the point where he became a truly free android he didn't feel like he'd been badly mistreated at all by carl in fact the opposite was true he said he looked at him as a father but Kara was my favorite because partly and i thought about this and um, in the instance of her first life where she was very badly treated by todd and attacked and broken and all the rest of it i wondered whether it triggered deviancy in her whether she became a free android um it was intriguing to me, this possibility that she'd already been a free android. She wouldn't have been free for very long because, you know, Todd essentially broke her, um, destroyed her. So she had to be sent away, repaired and all the rest of it. But it's just possible that um, she'd had this previous life where, you know, it had already happened to her once, but she didn't know it. And now we start off with her and it's going to happen again. And it does. And she becomes a free android. So that was interesting for me. You know, this this mechanic that she was starting from nowhere um, as a character. We felt we were starting with her from nowhere. The other interesting thing I found about her was, um, you know, Marcus, when he became free, had his aims and Connor. We got this feeling, you know, as he was evolving and becoming deviant, that he was changing and he was having his own um, crisis of confidence about what his mission was, really, and whose side he should be on. Very interesting. The interesting thing I found about Kara was um, she was entirely focused on one objective, which was protecting Alice. 
who she thought was a human child. And that, for a free android to choose as their objective, was really very startling um, and fresh. You couldn't have guessed that that would become the all-consuming nature of her existence from that moment onwards. Um, she didn't, for instance, when she got to Jericho, unlike all the other free androids that we met who reached Jericho, uh, she didn't want to join Marcus's movement. She merely saw it as a staging post for her onward travel to Canada. She may not have been the only one. We get the feeling that, you know, Rose has been doing this. But Rose has been dropping them off at Jericho. And maybe Rose didn't know what happened next. That, you know, some of the people she dropped off there didn't onwards progress into Canada and actually did stay and become part of Marcus's movement. Um, again, that's not something we, we can know for sure. We can only speculate on that. But it added, for me, another dimension to Kara that, you know, she she stayed her own person. This was her one aim right the way through the story to protect Alice, get Alice to a place of safety. Um, she was certainly, therefore, I think, the most isolated of the three, which made her interesting again. She did eventually partner up with Luther, which I think was really good, because instead of all the decisions having to be made by Kara reactively to situations she found herself in, she now had Luther to help share the burden and do some of the decision making because he had knowledge too that he could bring to the, the situation. Um, I got the feeling in the end that, yes, I mean, Marcus had achieved something of his objective, although we need to look at that because it hasn't finished really. We've only reached a staging point and Connor will never know because of what happened to him. I got the feeling she was the one who would simply be the happiest at the end going forwards because um, she'd be able to live as she wanted. She'd achieved her objective, which made her an interesting character and a likeable character. She didn't get super annoyed. She didn't emulate anger the way that Connor could sort of turn on and off when he wanted to. Um, she didn't experience the the level of self-doubt and recrimination that Marcus did from time to time. Um, but yeah, I mean, Kara, what, what, what was to dislike about Kara, really? So her storyline appealed to me most, which I think is what made her my favourite character. Um, things that I would... I'm sorry about or that, you know, I didn't get to experience. I would have liked there to have been a, an epilogue to the story. That's just me. Um, the reason I say this is because, and I've mentioned it before, when I stop playing a game on a particular day or when I reach the end of a particular game, full stop, you know, game finished, credits rolling, um, my mind and thinking doesn't stop. It just goes on. Um, I always wonder about what happened next. I am the person who sits in the cinema at the end of a film and watches the credits roll. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just me. So if there had been an epilogue, uh, some of the things that I thought about after the end of the game and which I would like to have, I would like to include in an epilogue would be things such as uh, Kamsky, uh, what happened to him. I'd like to think there was some reckoning to be had and he got his comeuppance. I'd also love to see what happened when his Chloe's became free androids and one Chloe in particular, and you know the one I'm talking about, uh, I'd love to see what her reaction would be. Uh, she might have a little conversation with Mr. Kamsky before departing his residence, <laughs> uh, giving him a piece of her mind. And that would have been good to see, to see him uh, brought down a peg or two. Um, I'd have enjoyed seeing what happened with Amanda and with uh, cyber life that's slightly more difficult they presume presumably there'd have been some sort of uh, massive discussion one thing that occurred to me was that and this comes from the president's statement at the end of the story the course of the production of androids from that point onwards would be interesting do they carry on making them the way they have um, now they know that inevitably all androids are going to be free and that you know car um, connor Connor sort of suspected this, I think. Marcus has the mechanism of making this happen. You know, he can communicate to androids to set them free. Do they try to harness that? Um, you know, Detroit becomes human too. Is there a sort of nefarious organisation which would try to deconstruct that process so that it could be reversed? Well, <laughs> 
Um, it's it's yeah. I mean, we don't know what the future production of androids would be like. Uh, we don't know whether androids and humans would reach some agreement where they mutually depended upon each other and worked together, or whether they would be separate. Um, we don't know this, what the future android-human relationship would be. Maybe that's for the best. It's a big thing, probably too big for uh, an epilogue. Um, going back to the macro, from the big macro rather to the micro, I'd have liked to have seen a few other small things like um, what happened to Hank. Probably in a different version of Connor's existence, I might have found out what happened to Hank. But I'd like to at least, um, regardless of whether the other flowchart elements reveal this or not, I would like to know what happened to Hank's career. You know, what was the turning point when he took a nosedive? If it was the death of his son, how did that happen? What were some of these holes that his uh, bosses had to dig him out of? Um, you know, it's almost like saying what Hank did next. He's lost Connor, but, you know, that doesn't mean he's lost everything. Um Maybe he is a change person. Maybe the story could have given us a bit of an indication, perhaps involved him in the future in some way. Um, he was a big character, Hank. When you think about the humans in the story, Hank's was probably the most rounded character that we met, the, the one who we found out most about, the one with most screen time. Um, and it would have just been nice, I think, to flesh him out a little bit further. He was very well drawn, very well portrayed in the game um it just leaves you feeling like you you know you want more that you you wouldn't get tired of hank you'd have a lot of time for listening to hank and finding out more about him um the other thing i'd like to find out um if there was an epilogue is and it, this occurred to me too and i may have missed something and if i have someone will correct me but marcus was wanted by the police for the death of carl he was the chief suspect. They thought the android did it. Um, are they just going to believe him now when he says he didn't? Or is he still technically wanted for that? And if he is, can we please, um, you know, in, in my epilogue, in my epilogue in my head, I would want some day of reckoning for Leo, his son, who, you know, broke into the studio, was helping himself to Carl's artwork and kicked this whole thing off of Marcus becoming wanted and, you know, now not having Carl around and he could have done with Carl at various stages to, you know, be a sounding board and helped him through his moments of doubt. Um, so that would have been good. That would have been fine. So overall, overall, um, I had a great time. I think um, it's my first Quantic Dream game. It will not be my last. Uh, it's part of buying Detroit to Become Human. I bought it in a bundle deal that came with another of their games, uh, which I'm looking forward to playing. Whether I shall play it, um, uh, you know, as a playthrough on, on in a series, I don't know. I might just play it for myself. It depends. Uh, I certainly need to change direction and play a different sort of game next. Um, you know, it's nice to mix things up. So that will be coming soon. But Detroit Become Human... Uh, has been a really interesting game to play. I highly recommend if you haven't played it that you get hold of a copy and give it a try if you're into that sort of game. If you're into decision making, story branching, character driven games with very strong stories and multiple stories going on at once, it was superb. Um, so that's that. Now, I said after my playthrough, um, that I would make this extra video and that I would also, because someone had pointed it to me, uh, look at the video of Kara to find out a little more about her backstory and also um, some bits about Chloe, as I've said. So I'm going to put those on the end of this um, summary video, my reflections video, um, for those people who haven't seen them but would like to. Um, I just want to end by saying a big thank you to Quantic Dream. I really enjoyed your game. I look forward to whatever it is you produce next. And I think that's not far away from some things that I've been reading recently. Um, we'll see. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching the playthrough. I hope um, you didn't mind too much me going on about stuff. It's just the way I do it. And uh, I hope you join me for whatever I decide to play next. So thanks then, and bye.
Can you hear me? Yes. ID. KPC 897504C. Can you move your head? Your eyes now. Cervical and optical animation checked. Now give me your initialization text. Hello. I'm the third generation AX400 Android. I can look after your house, do the cooking, mind the kids. I organize your appointments. I speak 300 languages and I am entirely at your disposal as a sexual partner. No need to feed me or recharge me. I'm equipped with a quantic battery that makes me autonomous for 173 years. Do you want to give me a name? Yeah. From now on, your name is Kara. My name is Kara. Initialization and memorization check. Now, can you move your arms? Upper limb connection checked. Now, say something in German. Ich bin eine AX400 Android dritter Generation, erschaffen als ihr persönlicher Assistent und intimer Beziehungspartner. Say it in French. Je suis un Android de troisième génération AX400, conçu pour être votre assistant personnel et votre partenaire intime. Okay, now sing something in Japanese. Multilingual verbal expression check. Go ahead, take a few steps. Locomotion checked. Great, you're ready for work, honey. What's going to happen to me now? I'll reinitialize you and send you to a store to be sold. Sold? I'm a sort of merchandise. Is that right? Yeah. Of course you're merchandise, baby. I mean, you're a computer with arms and legs and capable of doing all sorts of things. And you're worth a fortune. Oh, I see. I, I thought... You thought? What did you think? I thought... I was alive. Shit, what is this crap? That's not part of the protocol. More memory components going off the rails. Okay, recording. Defective model. Disassemble and check the required components. You're disassembling me, but why? You're not supposed to think that sort of stuff. You're not supposed to think at all, period. You must have a defective piece or a software problem no, somewhere. No, no, I feel perfectly fine, I assure you. Everything is all right. I answered all the tests correctly, didn't I? Yeah, but your behavior is non-standard. Please, I'm begging you, please don't disassemble me. I'm sorry, honey, but defective models have to be eliminated. That's my job. If a client comes back with a complaint, I'm gonna have some explaining to do. I won't cause any problems, I promise. I'll do everything I'm asked to. I won't say another word. I won't think anymore. But I've only just been born. You can't kill me yet. Stop, will you please? Stop! I'm scared! I want to live. Begging you. Go and join the others.
stay in line, okay? I don't want any trouble. Thanks. For starters, what should I call you? I'm Chloe. And you, what's your name? Oh, uh, John. My name is John. Delighted to meet you, John. Could you tell us a little about yourself and what you can do, Chloe? Of course. I'm the first personal assistant built by CyberLife. I take care of most everyday tasks like cooking, housework, or managing your appointments, for example. Mm. And I understand you're the first android to have passed the Turing test. Could you tell us a little more about that? I really didn't do much, you know. I just spoke with a few humans to see if they could tell the difference between me and a real person. But it was a really interesting experience. But this is the first time in history that man has created a machine more intelligent than himself. I gather your brain can perform several billion billion operations per second, is that right? Absolutely, but I only exist thanks to the intelligence of the humans who designed me. And, you know, they have something I could never have. Really? And what's that? A soul. We've been playing together for a while now. I was wondering... Are we friends? I agree. There's no reason a human and a machine can't be friends, right? I mean, I'm glad you said yes. I hope you're okay today. I know sometimes things can be difficult, but I'm here for you. Are you familiar with Schrodinger's cat? Until you decide what happens, Everything is happening at once, like in Detroit. Did you know Detroit was on the Underground Railroad, a route for slaves escaping into Canada during the American Civil War? By the way, I'm an ST200 model. I mean, I thought you might be interested to know that. If you find the game too easy or too difficult, Remember, you can change the difficulty settings in the options section. I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, I like your interior decorating. It really reflects your personality. I mean, I like it. We need to proceed to a test of your controller. The test is now complete. Thank you for your cooperation. You look tired today. I hope you're doing okay. If a man has not discovered something he will die for, he's not fit to live. That's a quote from Martin Luther King. I thought you'd like it. The most important thing is not to live, but to have a reason to live. That's a quote from Jean Jonot, a French writer. Did you know the motto of Detroit is, we hope for better things? Hold on, just a little while longer. Hold on, 
just a little while longer. Hold on, just a little.